Hi, welcome to Females in Fitness. I am Sarah Beth Hershey, and this talk is designed for anyone to give awareness to the changes that occur in the female body over time and how to adjust one's lifestyle in relation to it. It's super important for women to understand their menstrual cycle as it provides valuable insight into various aspects of their health and well-being. By being aware of their reproductive health, they can monitor fertility and detect potential issues. Additionally, understanding hormonal fluctuations help maintain a balance that can enhance athletic performance, improve mental health, and promote emotional stability. This awareness also supports better nutritional choices and wellness planning, enabling women to align their lifestyle with the natural phases of their cycle for optimal overall health. Essentially, we want you to take control of your own body. Short disclaimer, there has been very little research on this topic and frankly, just in women in general, and there are varying opinions. Every female is very different and has to determine their own normal. For the sake of this presentation, generalizations are used. All right, so there are four key hormones to cover to gain a better understanding of how the menstrual cycle works. So all of them playing very important roles. The first one is estrogen. So there's three different forms of estrogen that's used in different times of a female's life. Uh, the first one is estradiol. So it's the most common type in a woman of reproductive age. So it's very important in the development of the female body. Then you have estriol, which is produced in large amounts during pregnancy, helping kind of support the growth and the development of the fetus and the placenta. And the last one is estrone. estrone. Uh, this is the only type of estrogen that remains after menopause. So um, that's the one that we'll kind of transition into. There are tons of important functions that estrogen actually provides. Not only is it just um, the regulation of the menstrual cycle, but it also is important in the development of sexual, secondary sexual characteristics. So uh, why do females look different? Uh, it's because of estrogen. So it promotes the, the development of breast tissue, um, body shape, and then it distributes fat differently than, um, than in men. The bone health is also super important. So what estrogen does is it maintains bone density by supporting the balance between bone formation and breakdown. Um, so this is why, you know, as we get older and go into menopause, when we lose estrogen, we also are at risk for osteoporosis. The next one is cardiovascular health uh, or heart health. Uh, so estrogen helps maintain healthy cholesterol levels and has a protective effect on the cardiovascular system. Um, so once again, when we start to lose estrogen, we become increased risk for uh, cardiovascular health. Estrogen is also a big factor in skin and hair development, so it supports collagen production, skin elasticity, and hair growth. Um, and then lastly, uh, mood and brain function. So it influences neurotransmitters like serotonin, impacting mood and memory and cognitive functions. Um, the last thing um, is the regulation of insulin sensitivity and glucose metabolism. So um, what it does is it helps take that glucose that's in the blood into, uh, insulin takes it into the cells, and what estrogen does is it allows insulin to do that a little bit more efficiently. Uh, so it's super important, uh, which is why when estrogen does decrease, we have, uh, women will have issues with weight control and things like that as they get older. Progesterone, it's more of our pregnancy hormone. So this is the hormone that's going to um, enable pregnancy to continue. Um, and it's also going to be preventing any additional ovulation when pregnant. So, um, this one kind of focuses more in that area. The next one is the luteinizing hormone. So this hormone is found in the pituitary gland and it is an ovulation trigger. So it's the reason that the, um, egg is able to come out of the follicle. And then it's also very important for the corpus luteum formation. The last hormone is the follicle stimulating hormone, also known as FSH. And this is super important for the follicle development. And then um, the follicle in turn 
develops estrogen, which makes the, it super important as the whole cycle continues. We're going to start off with the reproductive phase of the female life. So this includes the menstrual cycle. And the menstrual cycle can last anywhere from 21 to 35 days, depending on the female, uh, with the average being around 28 days. Um, generally, females begin around the age of 12 and then um, start perimenopause in their 40s and then uh, get to menopause around 51-ish. So once again, every female is going to be different. These are kind of just averages. We'll break down the phases of the menstrual cycle into four phases. Um, the first being menstruation. Then you have the follicular phase, ovulation, and the luteal phase. Each one of these will kind of correlate with one of the seasons, and it just kind of helps us um, remember how the phases work. They also can correlate with the moon, um, and I don't have a whole lot of information on that other than it has been shown that night shift workers um, and people with altered circadian rhythms have more menstrual cycle problems. So just kind of something to note. So the first phase is the menstruation phase. Um, this starts on day of bleed and then it can last anywhere from three to five days. So we correlate this phase with winter. Um, similarly in the fact that you kind of want to put your sweatpants on and just kind of cozy up. The second phase is the follicular phase. Some people will consider menstruation a part of this phase and you just have the bleed portion of the follicular phase and then the non-bleed portion. So this, this phase begins um, after bleed. So once the woman stopped bleeding, uh, the follicular phase begins. Um, and this generally will go to around day 13. Um, we consider this the spring phase because we start to feel much better in this phase. Our hormones, uh, our estrogen level has gone up. Uh, it's really where we start to bloom in this one. The third phase is ovulation. So this can be anywhere from 13 to 15. Generally, on average, we'll say day 14. Um, this is when the actual egg is released from the follicle. Um, it's only 24 hours, uh, and we consider this summer. Um, if you think of like the 4th of July, this is kind of where the fireworks happen, right? So the egg has been released and it's ready for fertilization. The last phase that we'll go through is the luteal phase. So this phase is, uh, correlates with fall. There's a lot of highs and lows hormone wise that we go through. Uh, so this is kind of preparing our body for winter, uh, or the bleed phase meant back going back to menstruation. Um, so this lasts the remaining time of the menstrual cycle. So if uh, it's a normal 28-day cycle, then um, this, would, this would go for the next 14 days. Now that we have a basic understanding of the menstrual cycle and all the phases, we're going to kind of go into more detail on each one uh, and talk about how to kind of counter counteract some of the symptoms that we will feel. So we'll start with menstruation. This is the bleed phase. So it, menstruation is the shedding of the uterine lining or the endometrium. Once again, it can last around three to seven days, depending on the female. Um, our hormones, our estrogen and progesterone levels are going to be um, at their lowest. So when the egg wasn't fertilized, estrogen and progesterone go ahead and drop, um, which causes then for the body to begin shedding that, that lining. The LH and FSH are also low, and then our body temperature is going to be in the normal range. So some of the symptoms that you may feel are continued symptoms from the luteal phase. Um, so those might carry on into this phase. Uh, you might also get a feeling of relief um, because sometimes by the time we start to bleed, our hormones have kind of leveled off and we've adjusted to them. So you kind of get that relief feeling um, when it hits. You also might have iron deficient uh, symptoms. So uh, as we're bleeding, um, it's super important to make sure that we have an iron rich diet uh, to counter out some of those symptoms. And those symptoms are kind of tired, uh, low energy and things like that. The actual shedding of the lining is also an inflammatory response. Uh, so that's just something to note. That's something that we can kind of address in our diet to help with that uh, response. 
You'll also notice that you might have a little bit slower recovery in this phase. So that needs to be taken into account into your fitness um, activity. So a couple recommendations. Um, it's in regards to workouts, uh, it might be better to do more of the shorter strength based workouts. Um, once again, you may not have the energy level due to, um, the iron deficiency and the inflammatory response to do those kind of longer, high intense workouts. So kind of doing, focusing more on the shorter ones, uh, and saving your energy. You also want to make sure that you're getting enough recovery in between the workouts. Uh, since your body is a little bit slower to recovery, you want to make sure that you're getting that. Uh, like I said before, iron-rich foods are super important. Those are things like uh, green leafy vegetables. Um, lots of meats, especially red meat, will have iron in it to make sure that you're um, restoring that defici deficiency that you've got. And then it's super important to have some whole nutrient-dense foods that are high in antioxidants and omega-3 fatty acids to help with the inflammatory response. A couple things you want to avoid, uh, avoid the long strenuous workouts. Like I said, you may just not have the energy for that. Um, also want to avoid the process and refined sugars, refined carbohydrates, fried foods, processed meats, sausages, hot dogs, excessive alcohol, trans fats, kind of all that stuff is going to mess with your gut. And a lot of times what females have in this phase is are some GI issues. Um, so making sure that you avoid the things that are going to make that worse. We move from the menstruation phase to the follicular phase. So we've now stopped bleeding. We're moving into kind of preparing for ovulation. So this is our springtime uh, phase. So what happens is the pituitary gland releases FSH, uh, the follicle stimulating hormone. This hormone then triggers the ovaries to release these follicles. Um, the follicles continue to develop and they release estrogen. So we have a spike of estrogen in this phase as we get to ovulation. And now eventually one of these follicles will be identified as the dominant follicle and that will be the follicle that releases the egg for ovulation. So in this time frame, we are symptom wise, we're feeling really good. Uh, so we have high concentration levels, so um, we're able to really focus on things and um, kind of uh, have the ability to do more of those like compact, complex tasks in this time frame. Uh, our energy levels are usually higher. We're more attractive, so estrogen makes us a little bit more attractive. Um, we have a higher libido. So if you look at all this stuff, uh, the human body is fascinating in the fact that it's sole goal is to procreate, right? We need to continue the human race. So it's going to do things that um, makes you more attractive to the opposite sex, but also give you things to um, make you want to procreate yourself. So the higher libido in this time frame, You do have a suppressed appetite as well. Uh, so that's something that you'll need to, to kind of take into account when we uh, talk about recommendations. And then uh, you'll notice that your recovery time frame may be shorter in this phase and you're more adaptable to change. So some recommendations, uh, capitalize on this productivity. So uh, plan those important meetings, those important um, conferences, lectures, whatever that you have going in on your own life, anything that's complex that needs to be done, uh, try to schedule that during this time frame. Um, if you are going to have sex, make sure you use contraception if your goal is to not get pregnant. Um, in regards to fitness, this is where you can really capitalize on your fitness. So increase the intensity, increase the volume, uh, even the frequency of the workouts because you're recovering faster, you're feeling good, your energy's there. Uh, so this is where you're really going to see the results come for your workouts. Um, one thing to note though, if you are going to ramp up your workouts, you need to make sure that your diet or your nutrition is kind of correlating with that. Uh, because you do have a suppressed appetite, you want to make sure that you're fueling appropriate for those workouts. One thing to be careful with is as we get closer to ovulation with those high estrogen levels, we are at more risk for soft tissue injuries. So just make sure that you are warming up properly and cooling down properly to to decrease that risk. We then move into the third phase, which is ovulation. So in the follicular phase, we are prepping for ovulation. Now we're there. 
so LH uh, is released from the pituitary gland and that's what has the most fo dominant follicle release the most mature egg and that is released out of the ovaries and then makes it way, its way into the fallopian tube where it potentially uh, can be fertilized by sperm. Um, typically this is around day 13 to 15, we'll say the average being 14. It lasts 24 hours. Um, so symptoms in this phase are similar to the non-bleeding follicular phase uh, itself. So you might have some continuation of those along with some possible mild abdominal pain on the side where the egg is actually being released. Uh, you might have potentially some spotting as well. And then your vaginal discharge is going to change to more of a thin egg white um, like consistency. Um, so fascinating about this uh, discharge is it actually has a current within it uh, that enables the sperm to make it its way to the egg a little bit easier. So some recommendations during this phase. Um, it's, it kind of depends on what your goals are. If your goal is to get pregnant, uh, then you should have a sexual intercourse at this time. If it's not, then contraception is necessary. Uh, so one thing to note that ovulation is 24 hours. However, sperm can live up to 72 hours. So you need to be very careful. Um, you need to make sure that you are uh, using protection several days before ovulation, during ovulation, and then maybe several days after just to be safe. After ovulation, we move into the luteal phase. This is the longest phase of the menstrual cycle. It generally is going from about day 15 to day 28, and it's most notably known for its drastic changes of hormones. So after ovulation, the egg is released from the follicle. Uh, it goes from the ovaries down to the fallopian tube and waits there to be fertilized. So the follicle, that dominant follicle that had the egg, it is going to transition into the corpus luteum. And that's thanks to the luteinizing hormone, or LH, uh, for allowing that to happen. The corpus luteum is then responsible for producing progesterone. And progesterone is what's going to en enable pregnancy should that egg get fertilized. If the egg is not fertilized, then the corpus luteum slowly starts to disintegrate. And if you take a look at the estrogen and progesterone levels, estrogen takes a, a huge dive after ovulation. You will see as the corpus luteum uh, forms, the progesterone takes a steep uh, incline um, and then slowly decreases after the corpus luteum uh, disintegrates. Estrogen does increase a little bit uh, and then also decreases when the, the uh, corpus luteum starts to disintegrate. The endometrium lineum, so that the lining is going to continue to build uh, throughout the luteal phase and then pry right at menstruation is when it will start to shed again. Uh, if you'll notice, basal temperature is higher. It spikes in uh, ovulation and then stays high all through the luteal phase. So due to the, the drastic changes that are occurring in the body, there's a lot of symptoms that accompany that. So uh, the high basal temperature is also accompanied with a higher heart rate and a higher respiratory rate. You're gonna see a lot of the premenstrual symptoms in this phase. So uh, due to the estrogen drops, what you're gonna see are some cognitive, cognitive changes like the brain fog, mood changes. Because of the higher uh, basal temperature, you're gonna have difficulty sleeping um, with all of the drastic uh, estrogen levels changing, you will have food cravings, uh, pre predominantly carbohydrate cravings. Uh, so in, generally it's because what estrogen does is it increases insulin sensitivity. So when you don't have estrogen, it's more difficult uh, for the insulin to get the glucose into the cells. So your cells are craving some energy. Uh, and so that's why you're craving those types of foods. You will also have bloating, so a little bit of fluid retention in this phase, along with some digestive irritability. So a couple recommendations in this phase. This is where it's really important to be proactive, especially when you're in the follicular phase, when you're feeling really good, you need to pre-plan for this phase when you don't feel so well. 
So if you're able to proactively plan out or complete certain tasks that'll make this phase a little bit easier, it'll make a significant difference. Um, for instance, it becomes very difficult to maybe think through uh, maybe some uh, what's for dinner that night um, or in this phase. So if you can pre-plan that in your follicular phase and go ahead and have a meal plan written out, then when you get to the luteal phase and you're having a harder time with decision making or you're just not thinking clearly or you're um, upset for some reason, you already have that planned out because nutrition is very important in this phase. If we don't have nutrition thought through, then we're generally uh, more likely to eat things that we shouldn't eat. So if we can pre-plan our, our uh, meals, then it's something that we just have to kind of follow through with in this phase. And one thing we want to focus on is having more protein uh, to kind of balance out maybe those cravings of those carbohydrates that you're wanting. It also might help to have the smaller frequent meals uh, so that we can kind of get that glucose into the cells uh, in order for you to kind of um, kind of subside with those cravings as well. Another thing you might want to do is um, start some probiotics. A lot of times you'll see the digestive irritability towards the end of the, the luteal phase. So as we're getting closer to menstruation, so you might want to go ahead and get some probiotics on board to kind of help uh, balance that gut irritability at that point. You also just want to be a little bit more gracious to your body during this time. Um, you're not sleeping well, so sometimes you're going to wake up and you're feeling awful due to that. Um, sometimes you're, you're just having a harder time breathing because your respiratory rate is higher, your heart rate is higher. Uh, so your body is working through a lot of physiological uh, things at the time that you just need to be a little bit more gracious on on how your performance or how you're performing. So um, if you're getting frustrated with things not going as well at the gym, uh, just allowing yourself to kind of um, move through this phase, you still need to, to work out. It'll help with that mood stability, um, but maybe just trying to get into the gym and moving a little bit instead of trying to maybe hit those PRs. Um, one thing that you want to avoid um, in this phase, of fish, uh, especially, is um, making important decisions. Um, because our mood is so uh, fluctuates so much during this time, uh, you don't really want to make any life-altering decisions at this moment. Um, acknowledge those feelings that you're having, and then maybe kind of put them to the side. So that when you get into that menstruation or further into the follicular phase, if you still have those feelings, then making the decision then instead of making it um, when you're a little bit uh, more emotional in the luteal phase. We'll now transition from the reproductive phase of a female's life into perimenopause. So perimenopause is a transitional period leading up to menopause when a female's body begins to undergo some changes that signal the approaching end of her reproductive years. The phases generally um, last for several years and it's marked by fluctuating hormone levels, particularly estrogen and progesterone. And these can cause some various physical and emotional symptoms. So perimenopause is generally gonna occur in uh, the 40s However, it could be earlier or later, depending on the female. Um, so as estrogen levels drop, we become way more susceptible to certain health issues, including bone loss uh, and issues with bone density, heart disease, um, and then also metabolism uh, concerns. So we're going to see a lot of symptoms in this phase, and they can vary um, significantly through the years, depending on the person. So irregular periods are very common. So you might see that someone gets um, more periods. Could be that they miss a period. Um, you could also have longer or shorter periods. So there's varying degrees of um, what your period may look like in this time frame. Due to the fluctuation of the hormones, you're going to have fluctuations in your basal temperature. Then that can cause hot flashes as well as night sweats. You will also have some cognitive changes uh, due to the lack of estrogen. 
So you might see some memory problems and some mood swings. You also might have some sleep disturbances and that can be because due to the estrogen affecting your serotonin levels, along with the fact that your basal temperature is elevated. You also might see some vaginal dryness. Um, this is due to the, the decrease in estrogen levels um, that can also cause decreased libido um, due to maybe the vaginal dryness causing painful intercourse. It could also just be the, in, the decreased estrogen levels causing the decreased libido. Um, fatigue is also a, a big concern during this time. And then weight gain, weight gain due to the metabolism issues because of the insulin insufficiency uh, due to the lack of estrogen. So there are several things that we can uh, do to counteract this. So uh, exercise is extremely important in this phase. Uh, due to our increased risk of heart disease and uh, osteoporosis, we want to make sure we're doing weight-bearing exercises to help with our bone density, as well as cardiovascular ex exercises to heart help with our heart health. Um, we also want to focus on our diet and make sure it's, it's rich in calcium and vitamin D for our bone density, as well as healthy fats for our cardiovascular health. It may be that you... Um, someone in this phase would need some hormone therapy to get them through it um, due to the extreme symptoms that can happen during this time uh, hormone therapy can help subdue some of those symptoms to get a female through this time frame um, keep in mind that like we talked about in the, in the beginning uh, estrogen uh, estrogen changes over the the female's lifespan um, the hormone the estrogen that would be provided to the female is not going to be the same that, that the female actually produces on their own. Um, it may also be necessary to have antidepressants on board depending on the significance of the mood swings and uh, emotional uh, instability. So those might be also play a factor. Once a female has gone 12 consecutive months without a menstrual period, menopause is officially diagnosed. So menopause is a stage in a woman's life when her menstrual cycle permanently stops. Um, so in perimenopause, although the, the body is transitioning, it still technically could con conceive. However, once we have 12 consecutive months without a menstrual cycle, that's considered menopause, and that marks the end of her reproductive years. So it's a natural biological process. It typically occurs between the ages of 45 and 55, with the average being around 51. Um, the transition is caused by the decline in the production of reproductive hormones, primarily estrogen and progesterone. Um, so our symptoms are going to look very, very similar to the perimenopause symptoms. Um, obviously, they can change um, as we go through those phases. However, uh, most of the symptoms will be very similar. Um, so we still are at risk for osteoporosis, cardiovascular disease, the cognitive changes, weight gain, and metabolism changes. So we still want to focus on that diet and exercise as well as sleep hygiene we can, at this point can also look at hormone replacement therapy depending on, on the individual. Uh, you also have the non-hormonal drugs, um, including the antidepressants should we need them. Um, it might be a case where we need some vaginal estrogen to help with that dryness or any issues there. Um, and then there's also tons of alternative therapies if you're trying to not go the medication route or the hormonal route. Um, there have been plenty of studies that have shown improvements during these phases um, with yoga, acupuncture, meditation. Uh, there's all kinds out there that assist in this transition. We then transition into post-menopause, and this is the phase after menopause lasting for the rest of a woman's life. Uh, symptoms may continue in the early postmenopausal years, um, but typically diminish over time. Uh, and the time of that just depends on the female. Uh, so this is becomes our new normal. And all the risks that occurred in the menopause and perimenopause phases are also uh, happening in this phase. So we still need to focus on trying to cataract those risks with diet and exercise 
and making sure that we stay moving in this time frame. Um, we also need to kind of get adjusted to our new normal of hormones being at the level that they're at. Uh, so making sure that we are performing those practices to, to counteract it. Now that we know how the female body works, my challenge for you is to figure out how your body works. So October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, uh, kind of making it Women's Health Month, and I challenge you to track your cycle throughout the month of October. So for those of you that are in your reproductive uh, phase of life, uh, track your menstrual cycle. For those of you that are maybe in your menopause or postmenopause phase, um, I just want you to kind of track what your symptoms are if you have symptoms. Um, because in order for you to understand your body, you need to know kind of what's going on. So the first phase of this is to assess it. So in the month of October, I want you to write down any symptom that you're having and when you're having it. Um, you can write it on a piece of paper. You can write it in a journal. You can write it, you can use an app. The iPhone has a health app and there's tons of free apps out there. Uh, one being Flow, one is Fitter Woman, 28 Cycle Wellness, Lively. So there's tons of apps that have free options for you to put in everything that you're feeling throughout the month so that it can give you kind of a clear picture of what's going on in your body. After you, you are able to collect all that data, then it's a matter of analyzing it and going through and being like, and understanding what phase your body was in at what points. Uh, this will allow you to see how long your cycle is um, and how long each phase is. is. Uh, and then from there, you can kind of plan on how to be proactive uh, in order to plan those meal plans or plan um, those tasks that you need to plan based off of the information that you gathered. Uh, so the first step is assessing it. So that's what I want you to do in October is to find out what your normal is. Thanks for listening. The goal of this presentation was just awareness of how the female body works and why we feel the things that we feel. Um, I hope that you can now take control of your own body and proactively plan for all the uh different transitions that happen inside the female body. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Happy tracking.